This is part two of our interview with AMD's Raja Kadori, an SVP and Chief Architect of the Radeon Technologies Group. In this part of the interview, we talk about GPU Open, the Boltzmann Initiative, which is pretty interesting for users who interact with CUDA but might want AMD hardware. And we also talk about how software is a major part of the optimization problem, more so than hardware these days. So enjoy the interview. For part one, check the channel. We spoke with Raja about shader intrinsics. That's also linked to the description below, along with an article of this interview that contains a large transcripted portion. So I will let you get to the interview. Right. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a, a few moments ago GPU open. Mm -hmm. So let's go into that because I know that's a big topic lately right. for AMD. Yeah. So the, the first question, what is what GPU is open? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, what um, we, um, you know, kind of projected, I would say, a few years ago that with the transition to low level APIs, right, like say right. the X12 Vulkan and opening up the, you know, the underlying guts of the GPU through shader intrinsics and all, um, to get performance out of a system, right, to get per best performance out of the GPU, the best practices, you know, the best techniques to, right. you know, render shadows, you know, do lighting, you know, do draw trees or whatever, right, so there are different mm -hmm. ways to do that, but what is the best way to do that? That value add, we uh, figured out that that value add kind of moves into engines, right, it's basically in the game engines, and the games themselves have to figure out, kind of, they have to do more heavy lifting of figuring out kind of what's the most optimal thing to do. Uh, the drivers themselves have become very thin, right? And I can't right. kind of, you know, do something s super special inside the driver to work around a game's inefficiency and draw it better, right? And we mm. used to do that uh, in like the X11 and before APIs right. where, you know, when we focus on a particular game and we find that the game isn't doing the most efficient thing for our hardware, um, we used to have paths you know, uh, we call those application profiles for the for each application. We said, oh, you know, you could exactly draw the same thing if you, you know, change the, you know, particular shader that they have to something right. else, right? So we did kind of like manual optimization work within the drivers. But with this low overhead APIs, we can't actually, you know, we don't touch anything, right? It's just this API, whatever the game passes to us, it goes to the hardware straight. Right. There's nothing, <laughs> you know, that, that we do. So. We said, but how do we, you know, we have a lot of knowledge in optimization inside AMD, right. and so do our competitors, right? So we said, how do we get all of that knowledge easily accessible to the game engines and game developers? So we said, you know, we have lots of interesting kind of libraries and tools and all inside AMD. Let's make it accessible to everybody. Right? Let's put it out in the open. So that's why we said, you know, kind of GPU open, GPU open right? right. And, uh, and invite um, developers to contribute as well and kind of build this ecosystem of kind of, you know, libraries, middleware, tools, and all that are completely open, that work on, you know, not just AMD hardware, but work on other people's hardware too. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, the goal is to kind of make uh, every game and every VR experience get the best out of the hardware, right? And so, so that was, so we've started this portal with that, uh, you know, uh, with that kind of vision and goal. Uh, and, you know, we had a huge collection of libraries and all that we had internally that we put right. out. Uh, and it's, uh, it's got, you know, good, good traction. And it also became a good portal for developers to share best practices too. So, you know, for recently we had, uh, you know, some nice blogs from uh, some of the I key saw some of those, and, right? Yeah. In there sharing their techniques and all. Uh, and, uh, and you know, most more often than not, they, these blogs have links to source code as well, and right. you know, that hey, this is how I did this, I did that. And I think that's stuff, right? that's probably an important discussion point is just uh, this idea that the GPU does obviously all the hardware level work, but there's a lot going on in software, yes. where uh, just brute forcing visual effects or volumetric yeah. particle effects or whatever isn't necessarily. Best way to go the about best things. way to go to about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, software is more than fifty percent, if not higher, portion of kind of the performance that you see on a on a, on a system, right? So you know, the GPUs. I mean, you know, yeah, we have transistors that kind of wiggle around and do whatever five and a <laughs> right. half teraflops or something. But <laughs> it's like you know, if they're not, you know, appropriately scheduled and appropriately used by uh, by these software techniques. 
you know, they are wasted, right? right. So, so that was the intent and also tools, right? That um, uh, making developers productive in uh, debugging their uh, either, you know, their quality issues or performance mm. issues. Uh, what we noticed was that we just as a collectively as an industry haven't done a good job of providing a consistent set of tools, right? And, and frankly, if I'm a developer, right, just, you know, putting a developer hat, I don't want to be learning like, you know, one set of tools for NVIDIA, one set of tools for AMD, another set of tools for Intel, right. another set of tools when I get onto the game console. It, it, you know, it, what ends up happening is that they kind of, you know, don't use anybody's tools. Right. Right? They're yeah. just, you know, relying on just kind of, you know, printf <laughs> yeah. debugging or like, you know, this stuff. So that's not a good place to huge, be. For huge the obstacle right, too. Right? So, uh, so that was one of our goals with GPU Open is that, you know, hey, let, we put out our tools as well with full source code, our entire tool chain, and we want to encourage people to kind of, you know, help us get those tools working on other hardware as well. Right. Uh, now, we are not married to our tools. We are actually quite open to using other people's tools too, or, if it's, you know, some other company wants to contribute a tool and, you know, put it out there and open, we'd be more than happy to kind of pitch in and, uh, you know, get those tools working. Uh, because I think the opportunity the industry has, right, as we make transition to kind of, you know, this immersive experiences, right, mm -hmm. we are at kind of at the beginning stage, the first year or so of VR. Where we are going to be in four years is amazing. But the performance kind of, you know, if we just use today's software and today's hardware, the performance we, we need to be able to support a 16K by 16K headset at 120 hertz is a million times more in photo, in, in, kind of, you know, to get to a photo real right. level, right? And you're not going to get a million times more with Moore's Law, right? Uh, I said kind of my goal is, you know, we, we need to get there before I'm dead or retired. Right. A and we're not going to get there by just kind of doing what, we do, what we're doing because the entire software framework need to change. The software developers, the game developers need to be, they need to be a thousand times more productive than they are today for, for them to give us the million X, uh, right. um, you know, kind of experience. Of course, hardware will move forward. We'll have better hardware and all, but you know, it may be four times faster in four years, right? Or maybe eight times faster, right? Mm. You know, in, in different segments, but not million times faster. So, but software can make it million times faster, right? We've seen like, you know, the amount of wasted computation, like frame to frame in a scene is quite high, right? But yeah. that's, you know, but th they need different ways of thinking of generating these pixels, right? Uh, and there is some fascinating work going on in kind of both uh, you know, we look at some things, but, you know, game developers are looking mm -hmm. at a variety of things. So this whole VR thing has sparked a whole bunch of kind of fundamental research back on computer graphics right. again on, you know, am I drawing these things the most efficient way <laughs> possible, right? Right. I mean, you see actually, you know, frame to frame, you're generating, like, you know, each frame is so complex, and at 60 hertz, I'm regenerating the frame over and again, and you see, what is the difference between this frame and the next frame? Hmm, these 100 pixels. Look at but, but Delta's more. But I, but I drew, redrew the entire thing, right. right? Because that's the way the whole kind of, you know, pipeline well, yeah, and that, works, right? That, uh, I guess, speaks to just as one of the easiest examples, Delta color compression yes. on the memory side. Yes. So the idea of uh, basically not, not absolutely pulling the number for each color. Yes. If, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's for memory itself, right? Yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, delta color compression is one of the techniques, you know, we, we, we have in Polaris and all, right? It, uh, it saves a ton of memory mm. bandwidth because there's so much, um, what you call, uh, correlation between, uh, you know, neighboring pixels or neighboring texels, right. right, in there. So, yeah, so delta color compression is one of the techniques. But th there are things like that that I can do or like hardware can do in right. its control. But imagine the kind of things that the software can do because they know the context of their right. scene. They know what is changing, what's not changing. They know what can be reused, what can be reused. I, ca I can do certain things for them, but I'll be guessing, right? You know, they don't need to guess. Right. They, know what's, <laughs> they know what's going to right. happen <laughs> next, right? I mean, like one of the classic examples I give is that they know that, uh, you know, uh, you see in many games, especially on lower end hardware, when you have a big explosion, 
uh, in a scene, mm. everything stutters, right? It's right. basically nothing slow down yeah. at all because it's like massive explosion. Um, I say I don't know that there is an explosion coming in the hardware, but the game developer knows that there is an explosion right. coming in hardware, right? Say, say they, they have a mechanism to hint me, like say in, in to hardware or to the drivers. Um, I can do the, you know, I can boost to the max clock if I have some clock right. headroom, for example, right? Just for two frames, right? Uh, or three frames or four frames, right? Right. Uh, you know, that won't make make me go beyond my thermal budget or something because I'm staying within thermal budget mm. or, uh, you know, TDP limit. Right. So things like that, when the game developers start thinking in those terms, they have more juice available in hardware than they get take right, advantage like of queuing different like, dpm states or something like that right yeah they can you know they, they they would go like hey for most of my game i don't need to be running at seven, dpm seven right i really need you know because i'm smooth anyway so don't waste energy don't kind of mm. overheat the graphics card because when i need it which is like this explosion sort right. of massive stuff i need you to be there not kind of oversubscribed already and running at peak temperature right, right? That's one example, kind of him just saying that, you know, when developers start thinking, you know, performance, mm. uh, there is so much uh, interesting stuff available, right? Right. Uh, one, uh, one topic, I think, partnered with GPU Open. So uh, I was talking to Scott Watson about this idea of CE reservation. Mm -hmm. So um, True Audio Next was the example mm -hmm. that he gave where you can mm -hmm. reserve some of the CPUs just for this function. Yes. Can you speak more about how that works? Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, the... Uh, interesting thing about the GCN architecture, and I think even to date, it's the only architecture that's kind of capable of this, that, um, uh, you know, the first thing is the whole notion of the asynchronous computing, mm -hmm. where you can dispatch a compute task to the GCN engine, and it can run asynchronously to whatever else graphics task that's running already, right? right? And it kind of, it uses the CU resources that are not fully used by the graphics engine. Mm. Uh, right, so it can come in and it can go out without kind of, you know, halting or pausing anything that's going on. Um, now, uh, with that, kind of in that class of features, we also give the ability, say if that task that is coming in and going out is a real-time task, like mm -hmm. an audio. Audio, you know, it's not very intensive, but it needs to be real-time, right? It has right. to happen, like, you know, I say, uh, you know, I submit an audio job, it has to finish you know, within a prescribed number right. of milliseconds. Uh, so we needed an ability for the engine to say that, hey, no matter what for audio, you know, you can use all the resources, but I need at least one CU always available for audio. Sure. Okay. Uh, or two, or, you know, depending whatever, on whatever the yeah. task is. Uh, and so that feature is architected into our hardware to be able to do that kind of, you know, reservation that guarantees real time. Now, if you don't need real time, um, you can slide the async compute method. You can slide in and slide out, mm -hmm. but it's not guaranteed because if the graphics engine, say, is occupying all the CUs, right. right? Which is rare, by the way. Which is completely rare, where we have the the, the graphics engine completely oversubscribing all CUs. What we find is there's always one or two CUs you can slide in and get work done and get out. But for audio, we can't take a risk, right? Because you could have something very intense, like I said, this explosion case going right, yeah. on where everything is, and, and then you don't want your audio to crackle right, or stutter or... 50 milliseconds <laughs> later or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? It's like I have explosion in the audio. It's like, you know, the, the firecracker uh, right. effect <laughs> <laughs> that you have, right? That, uh, so you don't want that. So that's why we, you know, have True Audio Next uses the concept of CU reservation. Right. right? And, and the API uh, is flexible to kind of give developer control of you know, based on how much load they're putting, you know, how many CUs you need to reserve. So then what is the Boltzmann Initiative? Is that what that is or is this a separate thing? No, Boltzmann Initiative is uh, separate. It's related, okay. Boltzmann Initiative is related to our GPU compute. Mm. Um, so, you know, we had a long history and the industry has a long history of kind of, you know, the GPU compute APIs, right? OpenCL mm. is a standard for uh, computing and, right. and then their proprietary uh, you know, initiatives like CUDA mm -hmm. and others. Now, the kind of the holy grail for GPU computing always, right, if you talk to the programmers in, in the computing world is that they would like GPUs to be programmed uh, kind of directly 
in all the current tool chain that they use, right? C, C++, Python, Perl, right. whatever, you know, languages they use to kind of, you know, do their daily work. Uh, that, that's really what, uh, you know, they want to do is just get kind of, you know, hey, I'm, I have some uh, compute intensive tasks that can benefit from a GPU. I should be just able to use from my language, not kind of, you know, then figure out how to learn some new language right. like OpenCL or something like that, right? So that was the holy grail and that was what we were working towards. And as we were working to, to, towards that goal, what we discovered was the architecture of, you know, uh, OpenCL and kind of graphics APIs doesn't suit well for supporting, you know, all these random languages, right? You know, and scripting languages and all. Uh, we needed a, a completely different approach. And second, most of this kind of successful language frameworks, whether it's, you know, Perl's, Python's, and they're all, and LLVM has become a big uh, compiler infrastructure uh, that everybody's using, um, are all based on open source frameworks. And it is really hard to integrate a closed for runtime framework like the <laughs> graphics drivers into all of the stacks. So that was kind of the genesis for our Boltzmann initiative where we said, uh, what if we kind of you know, do a compute stack, which is all the way from top to bottom, mm -hmm. including the kernel mode drivers, is completely open, okay? And the way the stack is structured that these frameworks can integrate, right, to any level they choose, any level of abstraction they choose. Some frameworks want to go all the way to machine directly themselves, right, to the machine code. Boltzmann allows that. Some frameworks want to stay one level above, right, kind of like, you know, like a Vulcan level type of stuff, sure. you know, equivalent abstraction on compute. We give that. Some frameworks want to go all the way up to kind of high, some higher level language like OpenCL or C, C++ extensions or, mm -hmm. you know, some other libraries that we have sitting on top of this. We allow that. Um, so Boltzmann is the first open compute stack for GPUs, right? And it, it is one of the key steps we took in, you know, my goal of opening up the GPU, mm -hmm. right? So GPU was a, is a black box for 20 years now, right? Uh, black box abstracted by very thick APIs, right. very thick runtimes, very thick kind of voodoo magic what uh -huh. happens in there, right? So we are trying to kind of, you know, get the voodoo magic out of the GPU, uh, you know, software stack. Mm -hmm. And we believe that, you know, there is still voodoo magic in transistors <laughs> and how we assemble them. And there is voodoo magic in kind of, you know, game engines, compute engines, sure. these libraries, the middleware, and kind of in this experience. So, you know, the voodoo magic in this kind of middle driver layers is not actually beneficial to anybody because it's preventing the widespread adoption mm. of uh, GPUs, right? So if there's, it sounds like at least at some level, I guess the, uh, we work with Adobe Premiere a lot, right? And Premiere and these other tools, Maya, mm -hmm. often have OpenCL acceleration and CUDA acceleration. One of the things that I was curious about is, is there a way to take CUDA code uh, and make it work more efficiently on your hardware? I'm glad you asked that. So, uh, you know, one of the um, elements of our kind of Boltzmann initiative was, mm. uh, you know, a framework and a tool we put uh, in that, again, fully open source called HIP. And what uh, HIP does is exactly what you're asking for. It takes CUDA code and, uh, you know, runs it on AMD hardware very efficiently. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we got actually, you know, millions and millions of uh, could have code converted over with the tool. Uh, and like with the rest of the tools that we put there, it's right. completely open source and it can support other people's hardware as well. Right. So yes, so you know, we, uh, you, know, we you know, we have uh, no religion uh, against, uh, you know, enabling code, right. code to run on our hardware. Cool. One of the earlier projects you worked on was DXTC. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, Looking at the, I guess the modern equivalents to this, or the uh, the ants, the uh, that's that's sort of the ancestor of texture compression. Mm -hmm. What do you work with today to more efficiently process game graphics? We've talked about some of the stuff, shader intrinsics. Mm -hmm. What else is going on within the GPU? Yeah, I mean, you know, now that you remind me, that was 19 years ago. <laughs> Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, yeah. So DXTC was. Um, you know, one of the first, uh, I'd say, kind of, you know, standardized compression formats, and, you know, it's still kind of, you know, supported in, 
in almost all hardware and i think it's even in, on mobile <laughs> as right. well right <laughs> from uh, you know from phones to big computers uh, you know compression has evolved uh, in a sense uh, but you know the fundamental um, construct uh, for GPU based texture compression, hardware compression hasn't, you know, evolved that much radically, right? It right. kind of improved uh, in quality. You know, we got uh, more interesting data types. The compression is supporting the first, you know, instantiation of DXTC was kind of good for, you know, RGB uh, texture maps. But then we got like, you know, very interesting other data types like you know normal maps and you know light maps and right. distance maps has changed maps a lot and like they changed a lot so the compression uh, i mean we uh, evolved like you know ati and amd as well kind of we contributed to evolution of dxtc to kind of you know the next generation formats and other stuff and of course there are new formats and you know higher compression rates that are uh, coming too but I call all of these steps pretty, ev ev you know, evolutionary, mm. right? From a compression uh, standpoint, the um, you know the revolutionary stuff that the de developers ask for uh, uh, would be kind of you know every developer's dream would be, hey, if you can sample uh, a texture straight out of like JPEG or something, right. right? You know, which has you know much higher compression rates, and you know you could even get thousand to one, <laughs> right. you know, uh, compression depending on the content, mm. right? So those are kind of variable rate compression stuff. Um, you know, those are, I mean, if you uh, kind of understand, uh, you know, s hardware mechanics for compression and decompression and all, you know, that sounds good on paper, but, you know, it, it costs kind of, you know, it, just the, the, the decompression hardware to go at the rates uh, at which the DXT decompressor goes, it will be a chip that's bigger than the entire GPU just to do kind of, you know, decompression. Right. Effect. Just to you know, understand. And the reason why we don't do it is not because, you know, we don't know how to do it. We can. It just kind of costs, you know, an arm and a leg to do that. But um, I think there is a happier medium, again, in collaboration with the developers that is in between, right? Between, uh, you know, giving you that benefits of kind of, you know, JPEG-like compression uh, and the speed of kind of DXT class algorithms, right? It's like, how do you kind of, you know, connect them? How do you marry them in a better way right. so that all my assets from, you know, my authoring time to my, you know, your download time to coming onto the computer to, you know, into the GPU memory, right. can, if it can stay compressed all the way to the GPU memory, kind of the whole experience speeds up. Right, you know, like, you know, one thing that I say, you know, our hardware got so much faster, but man, the game loading time still is the same from whatever, last 15 years, right? Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Other <laughs> than like, play title, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, and there it's, uh, I mean, if you have an SSD or something, it's, you know. Yeah, that's a hardware faster. solution to a software problem. <laughs> <laughs> right, and there, but it's like takes, you know, loading time is, you know, uh, and, and with increasingly, uh, attention uh, deficit uh, population <laughs> right. where like you know on, on devices like this right. like, you know, things start instantly i think games need to start instantly right and uh, so i think there is a happy happy medium there that uh, you know you'll see i think industry together solving it in the next kind of you know over next three sure. four years is that how do we make like this terabyte triple a game titles just load instantly yeah that'd be, yeah that'd be awesome yeah I'll, i way down the road something like the ssg is kind of interesting too for that i reason. mean that's actually <laughs> the you know i'm glad you brought up ssg because that's that's one of the you know driving factors even though you know we have positioned it for first for kind of professional graphics right. and others right you know you can kind of you know see the see the path there yeah. of kind of you know the usefulness for uh, you know gaming users and other stuff too yeah peel off lanes from the cpu or whatever Throw yeah. an SSD on the graphics yeah, card. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, lots of information as always. Uh, we will have a recap of this in the article linked in the description below. Uh, Raja, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Steve. My pleasure. We'll see you all next time. Okay. Thank you.